sing that part, I'm going to sing. sing praises to you no matter what we face. God, no matter how hard the storm may hit, no matter what shakes us or what rattles us to our core, God, you are our source and you are our strength and we're going to raise a hallelujah to you because of who you are, God. In the middle of the struggles, in the middle of the fight, in the middle of the, of the journey, in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the loss, God, the loss, God, the tragedy, we're going to lift our voices to you because you're worthy. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our voices to be lifted, our lives to be lifted up to you. We can't build on shifting sand. We can't build on what the world builds upon. No, we build our lives upon you because you are solid. You are a rock and you are Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. We live for you. We live for you. Like this, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, yeah. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we're gonna live for you. And the whole there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to Worship with me this morning. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Today and you've had a rough beginning of the year, rough couple days. I'm here to tell you and encourage you today. Build your life on the one who is not shifting sand. Build your life on the one that is a rock, an ever-present help in times of trouble, and he will see you through. Hold on to him. He's never failed. He's not going to start now. He's the everlasting, the true one. And I will 
be shaken Though the world may push We will not be shaken Just set your hands right there where you're at You need something from God today Just lift them up right now presses in God the pressure inside of us from you presses back harder because you are greater and there is none like you God so teach us where to build our hope teach us where our cornerstone truly is
no matter what presses in, you are our cornerstone. That means, God, you are our firm foundation. You are the one, the refuge, the ever-present help in times of trouble. So, God, no matter how big the problem may seem, no matter what storm in life we're up against, no matter what our jobs look like, our family dysfunctionality looks like, God, you are bigger, and because you are bigger, we can trust you through the storm. So God, I pray today for every person in this place, every person that, that has joined us online, that God, every single person, that God, you would bless them, that you would watch over them, that they would put their hope and trust in you this year more than ever before, that God, they watch your faithfulness through the middle of the storm, because you are our cornerstone. You are a rock and our refuge. So thank you for that, God. And I pray that, Lord, your word will continue to speak life to us in this new year. That, God, you uh, charge us and challenge us as we continue to, to move through. And, and, God, may it just be a fresh spirit, a fresh wind of your presence, God, in our lives to navigate through all these great challenges we're up against because we know you're bigger, you're greater, and you are our cornerstone. And everybody say Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for worshiping today. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. The city of Fresno has issued an emergency order calling on everyone to shelter in place starting just after midnight tonight and lasting through March 31st. The faster we practice isolation and social distancing, the faster we can put this deadly disease behind us. A new and dramatically different way of life. The entire state of California, 40 million people now urged to stay at home. President city leaders will consider adopting an emergency ordinance that would prohibit gatherings of 15 people or more within city limits. But as Fresno County approaches the peak of the coronavirus outbreak, he's expanding and extending the order. The second extension lasts through May 6th, and it is not voluntary anymore. They're dead. Across the country, what started as peaceful gatherings protesting the death of George Floyd devolved into destruction. From New York, where police and protesters squared off in the streets, to Portland, where the mayor issued a state of emergency and a city curfew. While marking the unofficial end to summer this Labor Day weekend, more than 200 people at a California campground had to be rescued by military helicopters. The Creek Fire in Central California has burned at least 46,000 acres. Destroying homes, leaving a trail of destruction. We are completely trapped and even trapping campers. All the roads are burnt. The clock is ticking until it's time to return back to school. But the big question left to be answered is how school will look. When we talk about precious cargo, there is no more precious cargo than a child in a classroom. Dubbed the murder hornet for its powerful sting and the way it decapitates its prey, this is the first time the world's largest hornet has been seen in the U.S. Fire officials calling it a quote, unprecedented disaster to more than 135,000 acres now. California's wildfires are record-breaking and relentless. With coronavirus cases still high across the country, students, teachers, and parents have been forced to adapt to distance learning. As district learning continues across the valley, not all students have a parent at home to turn to. They're having to go out, you know, and work and they can't, they don't know what's going on with their child's education and they want to know more, but they can't because they also have to worry about ensuring that they have, that their children have a roof over their head. Placing a hold on in-person learning and returning to distance learning starting on Wednesday, schools are simply unable to operate under the current circumstances. The potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people's mental health is an increasing global concern, but are we seeing the start of a looming global mental health crisis? The real pandemic is mental health, that people are struggling with everything they've ever known has just been taken away and then there's a new set of rules. Does it seem much darker than it did before? Before does it feel like we're up against so much more? I kind of walk through here today 
And uh, as I have over the last several weeks, I've walked through this place. I've walked through our place of worship where we celebrate and lift up to God together as one collective group. And as I've walked through, I've thought of so many of you. Um, I've thought of your families. I've thought of your struggles that you may be going through. And I thought about our times of worship and it's brought so much joy to my face. And, and as, you, as you look out here today and as I stand here, I look out at the places where you worship and where you bring your families and where you celebrate who God is and you cry out to God uh, for many things in your life. I, I look at these two spots right here and I think of Pastor Terry and Ethel and but it warms my heart to think of them and so much love and, and encouragement they've given me over the years. And over here, I, I see my wife and I see Dina and, and Pastor Joe. He's everywhere. We never know where he's going to be. Um, and I think fondly of my family. That truly is my family. And I'm reminded of Paul that said, sorry, how I long to be with you. And you never know how precious family is until the family is no longer together. And I know that through this season that, you know, there's times that you get scared and there's times that anxiety can be high. And I know as a, as a father, I think about that for my children. I think about that, you know, for their lives and want protection for them. And I want the same for uh, my Crossview family. But in this time, I also know it's only for a season. I know this is only for a brief moment in time of what the span of time really, be, how big it is. And I always am reminded that our God is bigger and our God can carry us through. It's Easter week. Oh yeah, I love Easter. Easter's great. Oh, I love Easter too. And we want to do something fun for the kids this week. Okay, what are we going to do? Happy birthday. Happy, 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 happy Easter. Easter, Easter, Easter. You guys are so amazing. My heart is so full looking out here and seeing all your smiling faces and knowing that God's been keeping you safe and healthy and uh, knowing that, knowing that this ain't over. It ain't over. That, uh, that the victory of Christ is going to overtake all things. And no matter how, how we have to do it, we're always going to put in first. Amen? Come on, give me some, give me some horns. There we go. There we go. Hi Crossview, Pastor Kevin here, and I wanted to give you an update on the Crossview comeback. As you all know, we started Memorial Day weekend just a couple Sundays ago, and we've had some amazing services worshiping God in-house together. Thank you to everyone who has made that possible, all the volunteers, as well as all those that have come in to trust Crossview as we continue to navigate these very challenging times. I miss the people, you know, talking to them, hugging them, shaking their hands, encouraging them, and in return they would encourage me. So it was those relationships I built up over the years I really missed.
crazy kind of year. 2020 was definitely one that we will not soon forget. In fact, I don't think we'll ever forget it. A year of pandemics, lockdowns, quarantines, uh, a year where the, the news lines could not have been created in a novel someplace because they were so absolutely off the wall crazy. But in the midst of all the crazes, in the midst of all the chaos, our God has always been faithful and that is what he promises he will forever do. No matter what goes on around us, no matter what shakes, no matter what may rattle our lives, he is steady, he is constant, and he is an ever-present help in our times of trouble. In 2020, you know, really, 2021 is just another day, but it's a, it's a time when we look into the new year and we have a reason to have hope, a reason to have faith, a reason to have focus. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you who journeyed with us through this year. Thank you for being faithful yourself. Thank you for stepping up, many of you, in areas that maybe you didn't do before, but you stepped up because you knew that the mission of the church had to continue on. Even though things were shutting down, the gospel and the truth of who Jesus is must continue to shine out even in a dark place like what we just came through. So thank you to all of you. And as we continue to journey on in 2021, let's continue to keep our eyes on the one who holds us steady in his hands. And no matter what we get hit with, no matter what comes our way, he is the rock that never fails us. Thank you so much. I look forward to what God's going to do in 2021. As we enter in this year, I know that uh, so many things have changed. So many things have transpired this past year. Um, I couldn't go into my message without addressing that, you know, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. We still, uh, there's still questions. There's still things that people are, that, that we're trying to figure out and things that we're trying to navigate through. Uh, even as a church, we do the same thing. We put our best plan forward. Uh, we continue to plan out things. We could have a calendar that's full of events and activities already that was already planned back in October uh, for all of this year. We have all the things that are kind of on the calendar and ready to go. Uh, just know that we will always do our best uh, to provide safety for you as a family, for our Crossview family. Uh, but we're not going to allow fear to paralyze us from what God, uh, what God would, might want to do in the hearts and lives of people. Uh, I've seen God do amazing things and revival in people's hearts. I've seen people come to the, know the Lord through this season because of the fear and anxiety that's so great on people's lives. Um, and maybe you know people like that. Uh, maybe you know people who have been through a struggle. Uh, by a show of hands today, how many of you guys would just be honest with me today and say you're really, really glad, even though it was just a year and really we're just in another year, but how many are really, really glad that 2020 is over with? <laughs> yeah, pretty unanimous, pretty unanimous, uh, no brainer, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're done with it. Um, so as we stand here and as we enter into a brand new decade, a new time that we're going to be uh, in the presence of God. With this, this year was full of pandemics and lockdowns, and as you saw, horn, killer hornet, hornet beetles, what are they, hornet murder hornets or something like that. I mean, craziness, man, just nut stuff. We came through such crazy things, but even more than that, depression, sadness, separation, loneliness, um, more than that is loss of life. So many of us in this room have had the touch of what this past year held. And as we go through today's message, and as I do my best to encourage us and to, to set our sights on what uh, the hopefulness of this year, I pray that you'll hear God's word today. And I pray that as you listen to God's word, that it will challenge and spark in your heart. Uh, maybe new hope, maybe new life. Maybe there's someone in your life that's struggling, someone that you know personally that maybe needs to hear what I'm about to say today. So I'm gonna encourage you, pass that on to them. It'll be online next Sunday, so you'll be able to, they'll be able to watch online or bring them to church so they can be a part of it. But I wanna start by this verse today. This verse is 
is found in Isaiah 43. If you have your Bibles or you version, would you please turn in them? Isaiah 43. God was actually using in Isaiah 43, he's speaking to the children of Israel and he's encouraging them because they're, going, they're coming from a very discouraging place. They're coming from time of loss, a time of sadness. They're actually in a place where they have lost a lot of loved ones. They have been beaten. They have been enslaved. They have been beaten down. They, they are wondering, where is this God that promised us something greater? And Isaiah is speaking to them, or God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel, and I hope that you can hear these words possibly for our life today. Read it with me as we read this today, Isaiah 43, verse 18. What does it say? It says what? Say it with me. The first word is, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the, the past. Forgetting the former things, forgetting what has happened, don't dwell on that. See, God says, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? That means you don't even have an understanding of what God is going to do because it's far greater than you ever can imagine. He says, I am making a way in the desert and streams to flow in wasteland. God says, listen, you don't get that I'm doing something greater and I'm going to make things happen that people say there's no way it could possibly take place. I'm believing God that 2021 is going to be the fulfillment of this verse. I'm believing for lives to be healed. I'm believing for this pandemic to be a, 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 a obliterated. There's the word I'm looking for. Obliterated and totally wiped out. How many of you believe in that for me? Come on. I'm believing that even though the doctors and the science may say one thing, I believe my God is greater than the science. Amen. Hello. Science is important, not negating science and not saying uh, it's not true. I'm just saying that just as we saw throughout history, things that, the man, that science and man and mathematics even said couldn't happen, God did the impossible. How many of you guys here make our New Year's resolution people? You like making New Year's resolutions? Go ahead, raise your hands up. All right, one, two, some of you half a hand, some of you not even admitting it. Okay, well, uh, it's probably a good thing. New Year's resolution used to be, I think, a lot bigger thing. And I think for some people, there's some private New Year's resolution you don't tell anybody about because you're like, I don't want to make fun of when I fail at it, but I'll go ahead and make one. Uh, do you realize 40% of New Year's resolutions made on January 1st are broken by the middle of January? 75% of them are gone by Valentine's Day. And that's usually the chocolate one. I, I will not eat chocolate anymore. Valentine's Day comes, I'm eating it. You know, it's mine. Uh, New Year's resolutions are always something that don't really work out. Why is that? Why do New Year's resolutions not really work out? Well, um, I'm going to say this. New Year's resolutions have good intentions, and good intentions are good, but New Year's resolutions are not always God intentions. There's a difference between good intentions and God intentions. There's a difference between what you think is a good thing to do and what God really wants you to do, what he really is calling you to do, what the Spirit of the Lord is calling you to do. Every year, at the beginning of the year, I challenge our church, our church family, if you're new to us, this is one thing that I do, I challenge all of our church family every single year, I've done it for about five, six years, I want you to come up with one word. I challenge you to come up with one word that's going to be your um, theme for your life this year. What, do you, what are you going to do this year? So some say hope is my word this year. I'm going to believe God for hope in my life, and I'm going to bring hope to the people around me. Others people, it's forgiveness. I'm going to forgive people because, man, I feel really hurt by people, and I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to forgive myself, and I'm going to allow God's forgiveness to come on. I always challenge you with one word. So that challenge is still out there today. I challenge you guys in your own prayer devotion, your own private time, what is your one word that you're going to believe God for this year, okay? Today, I want to give you four questions that will help you possibly develop this one word, or your one word might come out of these questions, okay? So go with me real quick. Open up your notes. On the back of your notes, there's, on the back of your program, there's notes. Fill these in because I think these are going to be something that I think you'll want to refer to as the year goes on. In fact, I would challenge you to 
cut this out or cut this part of it and put it on your refrigerator, put it in your bathroom, put it someplace of promise that you can remember these questions. So the first one is this, what is one thing, what's the one thing you desire from God? What's the one thing that you desire from God right now for this year? What's the one thing you desire? David, King David was a man after God's own heart. In fact, here's what King David said. His one thing was, Psalm 7, verse 4, One thing I ask the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. What was his one thing? To be in the presence of the Lord. His one thing was to seek God, to know God, and to dwell in his presence. One thing that David had was his desire to be in the presence of God. In bad times, in pandemics, in lockdowns and quarantines, in fear and anxiety and relationship struggles, his presence sustains us. And the one thing that David wanted from God was the presence of the Lord. What one thing do you ask of God today? One thing do you desire from God today? Just think about it for a second. What is that one thing you desire from God? For some of you today, it might be that you have a loved one, someone you very much care about. They're far from God. They don't walk with Christ, and if they were to die, you don't know where they would spend eternity. And your one desire is that they would come to know who Christ is, and they would surrender their life to Christ, and they would have eternal life. That's your one desire. Some of you, uh, one desire is possibly the breaking of an addiction something that's very quiet to you. It could, be, uh, it could be alcohol. It could be something more serious. It could be marijuana. It could be drugs. Uh, it could be prescription drugs. There's one thing that an addiction, your desire is to be free from that. So others of you, your desire is that your marriage would be better. And you're going to pray about that. And others of you, it's that you, your, your one desire is that you can raise your kids in a great way and not kill them by the end of the day. That's your one desire. What is your one desire? What is the one thing you ask from God? Solomon, God said, I'll give you anything you want, Solomon, who is the son of David, King Solomon. God said, I'll give you anything you want, Solomon. What do you want? Wouldn't that be amazing? God, I'll give you anything. I mean, I'd love for God to say it to me. Solomon could ask for money. Solomon could ask for power. Solomon could ask for I would say more women, but he had way too many as it was. So he probably didn't want any more women. He's probably done with that. Uh, And what else would he ask for? And you know what Solomon asked for? He asked for wisdom. That was the only thing he asked for. God, grant me wisdom. And because God gave him wisdom, because God provided wisdom to him, the book of Proverbs written by Solomon, Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, because God granted Solomon wisdom, he had power, he had money, he had fame and notoriety, he had it all. Why? Because wisdom was his one desire he wanted from God. So again, I ask you, what is the one desire, what is the one ask you would ask of God? What is the one thing that you desire from God. The second thing I wanna challenge you with, or the second question I wanna ask you, is what is the one thing that you lack? What is one thing you lack in your life? A rich guy came to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. A rich guy came to Jesus and he said, listen, what do I need to do to have eternal life? How do I receive eternal life, Jesus? And Jesus said, well, you gotta follow the commands. He's like, check. You gotta obey your parents, check. You got to be a good person. Check. You got to go to the temple and do sacrifices. Check, check, check. He checked it all off. Every box checked. The rich guy was in, he thought. And Jesus said, okay, here's the last thing. Go home, sell everything you have, give to the needy and come back and follow me. The Bible says the rich man left because he did not believe He had the opportunity to do what God Christ was asking him to do. Jesus said this, one thing you lack, he said to the rich man, he said, one thing you lack is that you don't know what it's like. He says, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. And this man's face fell when he went away because he was of great wealth. What's the one thing you lack today? Now, 
let me bring it into our terms today. Many of you here today, the one thing you lack is Christian relationships. You come to church and you do your church thing and you check in and you say, check, check the box. I went to church today. Check. I read my Bible today. Check, check, check. But the one thing you lack is good Christian relationships that can help you find strength and find, uh, find meaning to life. That when you go through hard times, those Christian relationships, uh, they're not just going to talk with you, but they're going to pray with you and they're going to surround you. And they're going to say, you know what? We're going to fight this together. That's why uh, when we get view groups started back up and we will get them going again. Uh, the pandemic kind of put a kind of a damper on it, but view groups, it's what we call view groups, visiting, inspiring, educating, worshiping groups that come together, meet in homes around the community. And that's what it's all about, Christian relationships, doing life together, struggling together, getting in a group, I mean, getting in a group of people and saying, you know what, I'm hurting in this area, can you pray with me? Finding that common place, because it doesn't happen on Sunday mornings, it doesn't happen in this environment, it doesn't happen because really look at how we're sitting, we're sitting like a classroom, we come in, we sit, we stare at the person's head and the back of their head in front of us, and we just kind of go through the whole rig and roar, we kind of do it. I'm going to encourage you guys, the one thing you lack in your life this year that I pray God will encourage you with is Christian relationships. Other of you, others of you, you lack, ready for this, financial wisdom. You lack the opportunity to think about how do I pay my bills? How do I live in a budget? How do I make things happen? And I believe that this year, the, that lacking God is going to help you out with. You're going to learn how to trust God and honor God with your resources and see him do incredible things. Um, so many things that we can lack and you can kind of bring up. Maybe in your marriage, you lack um, the right communication. Maybe there's a communication breakdown. You lack Good, healthy communication, and you're going to pray that God would help you and your spouse find better communication. So what's the one thing you desire? What's the one thing you lack? Third question is this. What's the one thing you need to let go of? What's the one thing you need to let go of? Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read it here in just a minute, but this is Paul. And I, know, I don't know specifically what Paul is addressing in these verses. I don't know specifically what he is thinking about, but I know who Paul is, and maybe you don't. Let me tell you who he is. Paul was a mighty man of God, but before he was a mighty man of God, he was a mighty killer of Christians. He was so zealous for doing God's work that he was willing to take out any Christians who were Christ followers because they were viewed as anti-God. They were against the faith. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, here's what he says. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. What does he say? One thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to take hold of the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward. I don't know what Paul had to forget about, but I know this. Paul had some baggage. Paul had some things in his past that he struggled with. Paul was a murderer. Paul, uh, at the, at the uh, command of Paul, he commanded the stoning of Stephen, and, that, and he commanded that he would be stoned to death. He killed many Christians and persecuted many Christians under his orders. Paul also was whipped five times with 40 lashes, just to the point of death. He was beaten with rods, he was shipwrecked. Paul was also stoned, and not in a recreational way. Thank you. Some of you get that about lunchtime. He was stoned. He was beaten. He, was, he went through lots of things. And so he says, forgetting what is behind me, I'm straining on to what is ahead because what is ahead is a greater prize than anything in my past. Some of you today, you need to let go of some stuff that has been your baggage for so long. Someone's hurt you. Someone's betrayed you. Someone's lied to you. Someone's broken your spirit. You need to forget and let go. Some of you here today, you have betrayed. You have lied. You have failed. You have hurt others. And you need to let it go. 
Let go of the pain, let go of the past, and focus on the greater prize that Christ has for you. What is one thing you desire? What is one thing you lack? What is one thing you need to let go? And number four, here's the fourth question I want to challenge you with today. And take these home, think about them, let them kind of, kind of settle in your spirit. What is one promise do you need to claim this year? What is one promise you need to claim from God this year? Story time. You all ready for this? Here's a great story. King David, he wasn't king yet. He was Shepherd David. Shepherd David's in a field. He's taking care of his sheep. He gets a call from the house. Hey, David, come in here. He walks in and standing there was the prophet. The prophet looks at him and he says, this is the man. This is the new king of Israel. Because see, King Saul, who was the current king, had gone from being a righteous king to a very evil king. And God could no longer use him. He said, I removed my anointing from King Saul. Look for another. So the prophet goes and David comes in. He says, this is the man. This is the one. This is him. Because why? David was a man after God's own heart. So the prophet anoints David with oil and the oil drips down to his toes and he's anointed and now he's king. And you know what happens? He goes back to the field. Can you imagine that? I mean, the crescendo of selection. You are king of Israel. Now go back to the fields and work the sheep. What a kick. What a bummer. David continues to work in the field. David continues to have that promise in his heart. I'm king of Israel, but I'm taking care of sheep. I'm king of Israel, but I'm in the field and my best friends are sheep. Lamb chops. I don't know what's going on here, God, but you gave me a promise. Fast forward in King David's life, and he continues to believe that in his heart, and he gets ushered into the palace, and he becomes the instrumentalist that calms the, 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 the uh, spirits that, that hunt down King Saul, and he's so tormented with spirits, and when David would play his harp, it would calm the soul of King Saul, and he would be all calm and everything. Until one day, whenever King Saul started to figure out, this is new king of my kingdom. Didn't sit well with him. So what did he start doing? He started throwing spears and javelins and trying to kill the kid. All of a sudden, David runs away and gets out. He's out hiding in the cave someplace. Here he is hiding in the cave. This king of Israel is hunting him down. In fact, King Saul had given the command. You see him? Take him out. He's not going to get my kingdom. Now, just imagine for a second with, for me, with me. If you were King David and you were hunkered down in a cave, fearful for your life because it's about to be taken by the king that you're supposed to have the position of, you already know he's not the king. You are because the prophet said so. But yet you're in a cave, fearful for your life. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty discouraged. I'd be asking God, what? the deal, right? That's one word or two words. The deal. What's the deal? What's going on, God? You said I had it, and here I sit in a cave, fearful for my life. What are you doing to me, God? That's what I would do. That's who me. That's me. That's not what David did. That's not what David did. Here's what David wrote in Psalm 56 while he's sitting there, while he's, uh, while he's in that place, he's hiding out. Here's what he said. He said, this one thing I know, God is, say it with me, God is, say it again, God is for me. I'm trusting God. Oh, praise his promises. I'm not afraid of anything mere man can do to me. Yes, praise his promises promises. David had a promise and he held on all the way. He, did never, he never doubted what God was going to do, even though the circumstances didn't look like it. Even though it didn't look like he was ever going to be king. He said, one thing I know, God has not forgotten about me. God still sees me. When fear 
rises up in our souls, when fear tries to overtake us, whenever we don't see the promises of God coming true, we need to remember this. One thing I know, the one thing, the one thing I know, God is, say it with me, he is, he is for me. He is for me. He is for me. Um, 18 years ago, I was serving at a church in St. Louis, large church. Uh, I, God really did an amazing thing that I was able to, to become a part of that team and part of that staff. And I'll never forget uh, kind of the journey that God took me on. And 18 years ago, God started putting a call in my life to uh, to make a change and to go someplace else. And I remember fighting with God and wrestling with God and saying, nah, no, nah, it's not me. That's somebody else. So 17 years ago, what the change was, was God brought me to a place called Cluck Cluck, Iowa. I knew about it for, oh, about 20 years, my family had been uh, had come up to Keokuk and do things, and never thought I would ever. I never thought I would ever like live here. I didn't know coming up here when I was uh, for 20 years. I didn't even know they had a McDonald's in town. I didn't know what they had. I didn't know. I mean, McDonald's. That's the winner. That's the seller right there. They got a McDonald's. Okay, we can go. McDonald's. But I remember taking a, a step of faith and coming to Crossview. And I remember uh, thinking to myself and thinking to God, I mean, God's promised me many things throughout my life. God has made promises to me about uh, what my future is and what my kids and what my, what my life is gonna be. And I remember thinking, okay, well, Keokuk is the pit stop. Not that it's a pit, but this, it's the middle ground. It's the, it's the in-between to the next place. So one year goes by and I say, okay, just a little longer. And there was nothing, there was nothing bad. There was nothing unhealthy. There was nothing uh, that I can look at and go, yeah, I, don't, I wanted to get out of here. In fact, I, I find myself falling in love with the people. I found myself missing it. Whenever we would go on vacation, I couldn't wait to come back home. I started calling it home. <laughs> Go figure. I've had people ask me, friends of mine, pastors, people that I've done life together with and they've seen me different places, different stages. I've had them ask me, Kevin, you ever think you, you think you're going to die in Keokuk? Think you're going to die there? And I'd laugh and I'd say, no, no, I don't think so. That, war, that, that question continued to rattle in my head and I never said this before publicly. There were times I wanted to quit and times I wanted to give up, times I wanted to walk away. Life isn't easy. Life's not easy being away from family especially when you're close. I thought about that, Kevin, you're going to die in Keokuk. You're going to die in Keokuk. And I feel like God said to me one day, or he revealed to me one day, I've died a thousand times here in Keokuk. I've died to pride. I've died to myself. I've died to what I want. So all that remains is Christ. And I say that because one thing I ask, one thing I desire, is that people would come to know this Jesus that's so amazing. That they wouldn't know him just by knowledge, they wouldn't know him just by words on a page, but that you would know him as your friend, as your source 
that when life is tough, and whenever you want to give up, when you want to give in, and you say, I'm tired, and when the pain hurts, and whenever people talk, and people say, you just have to stand and know who you are in Christ, and know that he's called you, and know that God is for me. And if you're for me, God, then no one or nothing can be against me. So it's in that death, it's in that death that I find life. It's in that death that I find resurrection. It's in that death that I find peace. It's in that death that I find hope. And for you today, that's the same for you. In order to find the, the 2021 to be what God wants you to be, you have to die to some things. You have to give up some things. And you have to say, I, it's not for me, God. I know you are for me, so therefore I die to myself. I die to what I want, and I become who you want me to become. What are the promises that God gives? He promises you that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He promises you that he will never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He promises you today that he will forgive you all your sins. He promises you that he will make all the bad things somehow turn around for his good. I don't know how, but that's what he promises me. And that's what he promises you. He promises you that when you feel alone, you may feel alone, but you are never abandoned for he is right there. He's an ever-present help in times of trouble. He is strength when you are weary. He is hope when you are hopeless. When you're discouraged, he is the one who encourages you. He will guide you. He will direct you. He is the one who comes along beside you and says, I am for you. He's the one that promises you peace in the middle of a pandemic. He's the one that promises you that he's already defeated your enemy. Satan has been defeated. And Jesus is the overcomer. He promises you that nothing will separate you from his love. He promises you that you are more than conquerors. He says this. He says, I don't know what you know, but God says, I know that I am for you. What's one thing you desire? What's one thing you lack? What's one thing you need to let go of? And what is one promise that you need to hold on to this year? What's one promise that you need to claim this year? Forget the former. Don't dwell in the past. For our God, who's always good, is for you. And if he's for you, no one or nothing can ever be against you. Bow your heads right there. We Father God, for the inspiration right now in this place. God, I feel it. God, there are those here today that are just probably feeling so discouraged. God, I just firmly believe there are, there are some here today that their life circumstance that they're up against, they almost feel like they don't know how, they're ever, how you would ever do anything miraculous with it. God, their storm is raging all around them and they don't know which way to turn. God, I pray right now, let your Holy Spirit fill this place. You are for me. You are for me, God. You are for me. And because you're for me, I can have hope that the things I'm facing, you can turn to good. For my kids, God, I pray, cover them. Some of you today are saying, for my husband, for my wife, cover them, help them. For my job, God, oh, I'm so weary for my job. Give me your strength. So Father, let them find rest here. Let them find peace here. In the next few moments of time, God, I pray for encouragement to be upon their hearts and lives. God, speak to them. Let them know that you are here for them.
eyes closed, that's what you need today. You just need to take a deep breath and just kind of breathe in the presence of God. Breathe in his hope. Breathe in his peace right there where you're at. With head bowed, eyes closed, you're here today. And beyond the the chaos that's happened in 2020, beyond the, 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 the pandemic and all the craziness that personally, personally, you're struggling. Personally today, you feel lost. Personally today, you have anxiety, like overwhelming anxiety, overwhelming fear. I just want you in the next few moments of time and as we continue to sing this song, I just want you just to breathe in God's presence and just let his presence overwhelm you. Let it just flow over you. Let him just let you know, hey, I'm with you. Hey, I'm for you. I'm right here. I've never left you. I'm right here. When you're crying, whenever, you're, whenever you have those tears that, that maybe you don't feel freedom to share in front of anybody, I see them. I know them. I understand them. They are speaking to me because I know where you're at and I am for you. I am with you in the struggle in the pain, in the storm, in the work situation that is so crazy, in the home life, in the marriage, in the, in the challenges that you face every day, I am for you and I am with you today. He is for you. He is with you. He is for you. He is with you. Just breathe him in. Just rest in him. Just know God so for you. Come and rest here. Come and lay your burdens down. Come and rest here. There is refuge for you. Find his peace and 
thank you, God. This first Sunday in January, thank you for reminding us who you are. Reminding us that, God, no matter what we face, no matter how hard life may seem, that you are our source. Sometimes in life, we just got to take a step back and just let your presence wash over us. Let your presence just fill us. Just trust you that, God, you are for me. We, God, we strive so much. We work so hard. Yet, God, sometimes you just want us to rest and just relax and knowing that we are yours and you are ours, God. So, Lord, I pray today. Pray that, Lord, you would bless each and every person that's here and that 2021 will be a greater year than 2020. That, Lord, as we journey every single day and put you first in our lives, that, God, as challenges come our way, as things in this world kind of maybe catch us off guard, Lord, may we keep our eyes on the one who is steady, on the one who is hopeful, on the one who is ever true. Lord, may your face shine upon each and every person here. May you grant them your peace, and may you watch over them, God, all the days of their life, I pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great day. Continue to trust him. He is for you.